I'd like to uh, ask you about buy and hold, the ultimate buy and hold portfolio. I'm developing here a software of mine which is just backtesting different portfolios, not only passive, also active, but uh, there are like now over 40, let's say, uh, passive portfolios. And what I like about your portfolio is that it's it you can see a massive diversification in it. Uh, maybe it's a bit overwhelming to someone who's really a novi uh, novice uh, uh, investor, but what I like is really heavily, massively diversified. So if you could just tell us the philosophy behind the ultimate buy and hold portfolio. And also, by the way, just sorry, just one more remark. What I liked uh, is the, uh, the steps you were showing, how you are building that portfolio, adding more and more pieces into it and how it was influencing, how it was, you know, had the impact on the performance. So I yeah. think that that path is also very, very good to understand the whole process behind it. And that article, by the way, that we update every year, Jack, about the ultimate buy and hold strategy, we originally wrote that in the 90s. And we've been updating it every year. Uh, and, and basically, it takes about 10 minutes to update because you have to, somebody has to run the numbers to see the implications of that series of decisions. Um, first of all, the word ultimate. I am not pretending that ultimate equals return. I have no idea where the best place to put all of your money. If I actually had to bet serious money on it, I would say small cap value, put everything in small cap value, or maybe I might say put everything in emerging markets, small cap value. I mean, I could pick one asset class that's very risky and is likely to be rewarded for having taken that risk. But because I'm a defensive guy, I wanted to build a portfolio that included all of the asset classes that the academics said were likely to produce a premium for the risk that you took. And certainly, how many people have we heard that believe that it's hard to beat the S&P 500? And the academics show that the S&P 500 made about 5% more a year historically over bonds. So that's huge. That is huge. Every half a percent should add a million dollars to the value of your portfolio over a lifetime if you in, in, in invest in a, in a conservative way. You don't have to be aggressive. But I like the S&P 500. But then I see that large cap value is another asset class all by itself. You see, the S&P 500 is mostly growth. It's cap weighted. So those very big companies there represent most of the upside and downside movement on a day by day basis. It's not the little companies in the S&P 500. So... What do I know that let's call that more of a growth, but then there's this group of stocks that are out of favor and the academics have taken the time to show why that is a different asset class. And it's amazing how different it can be one day at a time. The market yesterday, it was a bad day in the market, but not for large cap value, large cap value made money yesterday, but large cap growth, lost a bunch of money yesterday. So I say, okay, let's, let's have some large cap value in the portfolio, but not a lot. Let's just, let's just have 90% in the S and P 500, 10% in large cap value. Does it make a difference? Well, I don't remember the exact number, but it's about two tenths of 1% more return because I add 10% in large cap value. But then there's small cap blend, another asset class that actually makes more than the S&P 500 because it's more risky. And when you add that to the portfolio, it makes another approximately two tenths of 1%. But what about the volatility? What's happening to the risk you're taking? Are you taking high risk when you add a little bit of this and a little bit of that? Turns out you don't, as a matter of fact. The volatility is about the same. 
and you keep doing this, small cap value, REITs, international large cap blend, international large cap value, international small cap blend and small cap value and emerging markets. You put 10% in each one. Remember I said the smart thing to do based on the past was put everything in small cap value. But no, I don't want to do that. I think that's too risky. And so the portfolio is built to own all of them. And this is where John Bogle said, Paul, you're nuts. They aren't going to do it. And John Bogle is right. So what do we do? It turns out you get virtually the same return with four funds instead of 10. Those four funds in the U.S., large cap blend, large cap value, small cap blend, small cap value. You want to add internationals? Can do that with four funds too. U.S. large cap blend, international large cap value. International small cap blend, U.S. small cap value. About the same return again. Now you need to know what ETF should I own to have those 10 or 4 investments? And we give them to you. Chris Pedersen has taken the time, an engineer by trade. He, I just interviewed him yesterday. His grandfather taught him to say when he was two years old, I am a financial wizard. That's what he taught him to say. And doggone it if he didn't become one. But he has taken the time to go through all of the ETFs to pick the ones, whether you're looking at four funds globally or the U.S. or the 10 funds, so that you can build your own portfolio and we don't make one penny. Um, you are also a big fan of the small cap value. And I saw some article there. I don't know if you had a chance to look at it, earlyretirementnow.com. And there is a there is a counter argument that um, the small cap value, indeed, they are good. But when we are looking uh, in the old history, then maybe the data is not of very good quality. Or also maybe that um, that was working in the past, but it's not going to work now. I mean, to be honest, for me, I, I don't have a strong opinion on that. I think that we have to we have to be just very patient. And the history showed that definitely what Professor Fama and Professor French were teaching us that there is something in it. But how would you respond to that article that there is maybe it was maybe uh, a party which is over? Well, I, I, I know that well. That, that article was written after I had a, an interview with the folks at Choose FI. Uh, and when I say I was saddened by it, um, I was only saddened by it because I really didn't have a chance to respond to it. And, uh, and by the way, I, I am sure the folks at Choose FI would have allowed me to if I had asked, but um, I thought they if, if they thought it was important enough, uh, they would ask me to respond. But here is the response. Uh, Daryl Balls, he's our director of analytics, another engineer, retired engineer from uh, systems uh, analyst from Boeing and manager. And uh, he does does some marvelous work. But one of the things he built was a telltale chart for small cap value versus the S&P 500. And what you will quickly see, if you kind of look just at the bottom line, is over the last 90-some uh, years, uh, the small cap value has produced about 14 times higher return than the S&P 500, yeah. which should not be a shock because small cap value is more risky. But what people are not ready for is that you have to be willing to live through periods of 10 to 20 years of, I'll call it underperformance. And the reason I call it underperformance is because for that 10 or 20 years, you basically end up producing the same return as the S&P 500. You did it and you didn't get a premium. 
But then the premium comes and has has tended to come in very relatively short spurts of time. And, and, and this, unfortunately, is the problem that we have with any great uh, investment asset class. I look, for example, at the S&P 500. Why aren't there studies coming out telling us that the expected rate of return of the S&P 500 in the future is going to be much less than the past? Because since the year 2000, in fact, from 2000 to a couple of years ago, the compound rate of return was about five or five and a half percent. And -hmm. like you mentioned, Jack, the previous 25 years, uh, it was a 17% compound rate of return. You know, what's wrong with this picture? Have we, is there a change in the expected rate of return of, of the S&P 500 and that where we should be investing is in cryptocurrency? I mean, there, these are all decisions that investors have to make. And so when I say that I put my stock in, in terms of confidence in the academics, they don't hide the fact that there'll be long periods of underperformance. That's that's just baked in the cake. And there is not any asset class that has a long period of outperformance without going through these long periods of underperformance. And, and, and my challenge and trying to be an educator and help people make a lifetime decision for long after I'm gone is to convince them that there are a group, a small group of asset classes that are likely to serve you well. And if you're lucky enough in the early years of, of investing in those asset classes, that the market is in decline, that people are losing money, and you are buying up these asset classes at discounted prices. I'm sorry I'm not there to break open the champagne with you, but by golly, if I could, I would, because that's what you should want, rather than being scared out of it and concluding this is the wrong thing to do. All right. So uh, would you agree with that saying that no pain, no gain, that in fact, the, the small cap value, um, in order to capture that premium, we have to go through the, 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 the periods, which, as you say, underperform, underperform in the way that we are not even losing money, but we are maybe on the level of the S&P 500 or, or, you know, we are not receiving that premium. So there will be such periods. And if there would not be so uh, such periods, then there will be no premium for that risk. But, and, and Jack, there's one thing more. You know, small cap value is fine. But most people don't understand that small cap value runs a range from very large small cap value companies that aren't very deeply discounted value companies to very small small cap value companies with very deeply discounted value companies. It's like multiple asset classes within one asset class, and it matters. I look at what Chris Pedersen in his best in asset class uh, recommendations at the first of this year, his choice for small cap value is a fund that is has been developed by a company called Avantis. And Avantis, so far this year, is, pardon me, is up about 48%, while other small cap value funds are up 25 to 30. It's not magic. It isn't like they did anything special. They happen to build their portfolios on average in a smaller cap value company with more deeply discounted value with a focus on quality of earnings. So it is an asset class in essence by itself. And, 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 and so I want people, the reason I would like people to know about our work is it's not about me, it's about the work that Chris Pedersen has done to look at each one of these ETFs. They all have a reason for why they are built the way they are. And by the way, I think that uh, 
that people who are working in that company, who set up that company, Avantis, they are coming from Dimensional, if I'm not wrong, yes. where Dr. F uh, Professor uh, French and, 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 uh, and Fama are also involved. And, and that is, again, this is all going back to the academic community. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have a question regarding the ultimate buy and hold because there are people also who are gold bags or are strongly believing in gold or maybe even broadly in commodities. But I know that you are not fan of both. I mean, gold and commodities as a, as a, as a group even. Would you uh, be able to just explain a bit why you're not a big fan of commodities and, and gold in particular? Well, part of this, I guess I would credit to uh, Warren Buffett and part I would credit to Dennis Tilley. Dennis Tilley uh, is the gentleman who runs that hedge fund I talked about. Uh, and uh, he, 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 he gave me a lesson on commodities and how they're priced and what kind of return one should expect. Uh, gold first. Uh, gold, uh, there are myths of, uh, about investing. Uh, I've got over 200 of them that I've accumulated over the years will be eventually part of a book of a thousand things you should know about investing. Uh, but um, the, the, the myth is, is that gold performs well when the market declines. And the truth is that really isn't where historically you want to be when the market's in collapse. Uh, the best place to be historically uh, is in long-term treasuries. Now, I'm cherry-picking that because I know that when the market collapses, there is a rush to something that is very dependable, has a history of being dependable. Uh, gold has a history of being very volatile. It hasn't got a, a history of being dependable. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's many times more risky than long-term treasury bonds, and yet the return over the last 50 plus years uh, is very similar. So if I am going to own bonds or treasury bonds as a way of hedging against the catastrophic, uh, that is what I would look to uh, rather than gold. Uh, now that doesn't mean there aren't times when gold acts the way that people in the gold industry say it acts. There will be times it does. I have the good fortune of having friends in the gold industry that I've known for many, many decades. I have never been with my friends in the gold industry that don't have the ability to sit down and in five minutes convince me gold is the place to be. It's like asking an insurance salesperson, do I need insurance? The answer is yes. <laughs> this is the thing to do. And so... I just want to be realistic. Now, the commodities, what Dennis Tilly convinced me and showed me, remember, I am but a, a, a salesperson collecting information from really intelligent people and then passing it on. But b basically, the expected rate of return is treasury bills, uh, uh, less expenses. Sometimes it will be better. Sometimes it will be worse. I mean, if you looked at the last, uh, I don't know, 20 years, commodities have lost substantial amounts of money. I don't have that right in, in, in front of me. Uh, but again, if I'm looking for something to act as, a, as a, uh, an asset class that will to create uh, stability uh, during a declining market, I'm m much more comfortable uh, with long-term bonds. Having said that, I don't sit on long-term treasuries. I sit on short to intermediate and tips. The reason being is that I don't really look to these uh, uh, assets as a protection against the catastrophic so much as just to bring the volatility down. And the thing about long-term treasuries is when we have a big rise in interest rates, those long-term treasuries are going to be hit hard, whereas the short to intermediate historically have very small losses during periods of rising interest rates. So 
it's always this interesting decision. Uh, in the 12, in the, that book, of the, we're talking millions. If you look at what I've done, I've taken you to a fork in the road, stocks versus bonds. What are the implications? How about, how about mutual funds versus individual stocks? Why would I go one way or another? Index funds versus active management. Roth IRA versus regular IRA. There are forks in the road, and I just, what I try to do to make it possible to think through these maybe hundreds of decisions that we make is I take them one at a time, and I look at the implication of each fork in the road, and then I think, if I've got to do 200 of them, okay, I'll do 200 of them, but they'll really be based on each one being an individual, carefully, unemotional decision that seems right from everything I know about the past without a conflict of interest. And by the way, regarding commodities, uh, before our interview, I checked the S&P uh, Goldman Sachs Commodity Index. And in the last 50 years, the maximum drawdown was almost 90%. <laughs> Uh, so because you compared this to to to, to bonds, so that's I mean the the volatility and maximum drawdown was just uh, terrible. Um, so now, now just, Jack, I got to ask a question. You got me all excited here for a second. Are you saying your database has that information in there? Yes, correct. Wow, I I, I know you're here to interview me, but can I, can I just ask you because I know that some of our listeners are going to be interested. Just give us, please, a handful of the databases that you have in there that go back a long time for people who like tracking that stuff. So for majority, major, I um, mean, indexes, uh, the data is going back even to the beginning of the 20th century. Mm. Uh, for things like, for example, commodities, it's like around 50 years. But most of the passive portfolios, if you build them in that software, you can... You can backtest them for up to 50 or even 100 years, or even wow. more than 100 years, which Do is, I think... you the dividends? Uh, yes, of course. Yes, so, so of course, it's uh, including dividends, so it's a total return. So I think that uh, looking into such a long history is giving us a lot of information about the markets, and it's a great a way to learn about the markets and uh, about our expectations to set them on the right level. And uh, you mentioned, for example, now the bonds that uh, you are more in the short term or intermediate. Yeah. And in fact, yes, for like 40 years, we had a period in which bonds in real terms were giving us the negative returns and that yeah. that that was 40 years period uh, from 1940 till like 81 1981 so there's nothing new i would say and just looking in such a long history we can we can uh, we can learn about it and by the way regarding this commodity index again um, i think that it's so much uh, popular among investors it's because it's so volatile and sometimes we can see in the news that it just you know uh, is giving a hundred percent return in the last two years but this is just two years but if you look on the really long term in the 50 years time you see that bonds are giving the same return with a much much lower um, of risk so so, so, so um, I can also ask Jack are those are your figures both real and nominal you, you, you show both before and after uh, inflation? I have uh, also nominal, so I, I mean nominal, and then I can also adjust them to inflation. Uh, so you can see how they look in the real terms uh, after uh, inflation adjustment. And one more question. Do you have monthly uh, data or is it annual data? Um, so I have monthly data, especially the data which is going back uh, decades. Um, but the, for the last uh, uh, 20 years, I have also daily data. But the, the data which is going really very far, it's a monthly data. So for people who are, who are watching this, who are interested in looking and maybe even testing uh, this kind of information. Uh, is your subscription, the thing I noticed, it's it's Windows based. Is it also available somehow for for Mike for Mac? 
Unfortunately, not. I mean, you can run it on Mac, but you have to use, like, for example, uh, Parallels Desktop, which is kind of running Windows on top of Mac. So I think that this is indeed a big bit of problematic for those who are on Mac. Although I'm personally also a Mac user and I can run it on, on Windows. Uh, so it's for people who are really willing to have access to that, it, even if they are on Mac, it should not be a, a problem, obstacle, to, which is not uh, you know, solvable. So I think it's, it, there are ways to, to go around it. So then I have to ask, uh, what is the uh, shortest period of time what, what what does it cost for a year of 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 uh, to, to to have access to all this? So currently, I have two plans for one year and for two years, and the price for one year subscription it's one hundred seventy nine dollars. So basically, uh, then you get for the whole year you have the application with all that historical data, plus you have access also to over seventy exchanges around the world with the current data and also with the history going back to 30 years, uh, daily data, uh, I mean here. So basically, from wherever you are located in the world, you can build a portfolio. And also, what is, I think, interesting for people who are not maybe living in the United States is that you can build a portfolio and then you can, and then you can see how it was performing in other currency, let's say like in Europe, you can see how it's performing in Euro. Wow. If you are in, uh, let's say, um, in uh, in Canada, in Canadian dollar, if you are in Japan, in Japanese yen, for example, so that you can see how that uh, portfolio was, because, you know, there are differences, of course. Yes. If you buy, uh, even if you have a global exposure to the stock market, there is more than 50% of United States, but there is still like over 40% of other different currencies so that that portfolio will perform differently in different uh, currencies so so you right. can check that as well so i think it's it's i to me i think it's good for both uh, purposes the educational and then also if you want to uh, do the practical exercise and and just do your homework if you are do it yourself investor and you want to do your homework properly not only by reading the theory theory but also just doing a real exercise i think it's a it's a great way to do so because because uh, you have in one place everything you need uh, and obviously someone can say it's just only history but that's what i wanted to ask you how do you see that that quite often i see people are criticizing that that um, well it's great tool but it's just only telling us what happened but what will happen um, what I'm answering to these people is that, oh, well, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't have a data from the future <laughs> yet, but uh, I wish to have. But um, I don't think that investing is about, you know, predicting the future because no one knows the future. But the history is really telling us a lot. Uh, and I'm just wondering how you see that uh, that thing about backtesting because uh, it's very easy to criticize it because people are saying that now it, that this time is really different and they are telling this i i believe always probably when we when you were starting in the 60s people were also saying that it's yeah. this time is different it's always always, <laughs> always is what they what they say jack and my view is this that as an investor myself i want to know what, uh, what are the range of returns that I should expect? Now, the problem is I am 78 years old and I'm trying to make, a, uh, make some sort of a judgment about the return that I'm going to get for the next 10 or 12 years, let's say, if I'm lucky to live that long. And there's nobody uh, that can tell you, but I can tell you this. When I look at every 40-year period, and Daryl has got this information together for us, every 40-year period with the S&P 500, uh, the average return was about 11%. Now, that's much higher than we normally think, except that when you look at all the 40-year periods, you quickly, when you start in 1928, you quickly get beyond the early 30s and they no longer are part of the 40 years, and all of a sudden the return looks better. But 
uh, I'm okay using the 10% as the expected long-term return, but I also know there's a chance it could be better. But I also know that the worst 40 years was 8.9%, and the best was 12.5% for the S&P 500. Now I want to know what do the worst losses look like? Well, I know from history that there's a calendar year that I would have lost 43% on the S&P 500. There was another year I would have been up 54%. I can know all this stuff. And is there a value to it? Well, let me just give you one example where I can say, I told you so. And that is 2000 to 2009. The S&P 500 uh, compounded at a negative approximately 1% a year. It had two bear markets, substantial bear markets, that took 50% of the value of the market uh, before it recovered. And uh, the compound rate of return from 1930 to 1939 was, uh, or 29 to 38, I guess it is, uh, w was actually a little better. In other words, they'd already, if, if they believed, I've been showing them these, these periods looking backwards and saying, that's coming, folks. I can't guarantee you that's coming, but it's coming. And people are, well, that's not the same. You know, we have the SEC now and we have the Investment Company Act of 1940 and all these reasons. And and, and more people are involved in investing, not just a few people. Turns out, even with all those things going on, the, re, the, the loss was substantially this, the, the same as it was back in that period during the Depression. And that, to me, is helpful. Because then I can also take that period from 2000 to 2009 and 1929 to 2000, uh, 1938 and say, what if... What if I had a thousand dollars? What was it worth at the end of that period? Ah, what if I only had a hundred dollars a year to put in over that 10 year period? What did that look like? There are such huge lessons because, as you know, when you put a hundred dollars a year and you dollar cost average into that terrible market, you come out with a big win, not a big loss. So I do believe. Those old numbers have a, a, a lot of value, but I also know this. It's kind of like I recently did an article that had and a podcast in December of 2019. I did a podcast that's had almost a half a million opens. And the 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 title is the number one reason to buy index funds. And basically what I say on the podcast is that if you buy index funds, you don't have to talk to a salesperson ever. <laughs> and that can pay huge rewards over a lifetime. People just don't know how big those rewards could be because the, if they, by the way, if they buy the index fund and they never talk to a salesperson, they never know what might have happened had they talked to a salesperson or loan money to their uncle. But but the same thing is true of looking backwards versus people who claim to see the future. I don't trust people who claim to see the future. I don't mean that they aren't trying their best to put a whole bunch of variables together and tell us where it's what, what's going to come out of that. There's big money to be made selling that kind of information to folks. I understand that, but is it possible you would come to a conclusion that is totally uh, unmoved by what really happens? Because what really happens is the random thing we didn't expect, like a pandemic, and then the pandemic turns out to be good for the economy rather than bad. I mean, go figure all these things that happen and then ask, am I better understanding the past and the nature of market movements or do I look to some guru who can see into the future? I think they're con men and women. By that, I only mean they con themselves. Not They don't con me because they don't get to me. They are conning themselves 
but I also understand that the nature of the human being is we make up stories about everything that happens in our lives. And it turns out that very few of the stories we make up are even true. So that's kind of how I feel about, about the, the, the past versus some sort of an evaluation of the future. I trust the past. And by the way, I trust the fact that the academics looked at it, not that they waited for me to get to it because I was not qualified to get to it. Uh, for example, to me, very surprising was when I looked at the re results of the market during the Second World War because you mentioned the COVID-19. When I looked at the data from 1939 till the end of 1945, um, we could expect that it was a nightmare for the markets. And in fact, yes, there were countries like Germany and Japan where the markets, you know, there was like over 90% drawdown. But in total, the global markets, if you would look on monthly basis, how they performed, it was really, you wouldn't, and I would just not show you the, the, the years, yep. you wouldn't tell that it's during the Second World War. The, as Winston Chir Churchill was saying, it's business as usual. I mean, you wouldn't say that it was during the Second World, World War. It and it makes sense, does it? I mean, it's this is one of the challenges. We want to make sense out of something that doesn't care about what we believe. And the one thing that I've been teaching for 50 years, there is no risk in the past. We always know what we should have done. And it makes it look like, well, if we'd only done that one thing, we would have done well. In my case, I have a friend who basically has or had almost all of her money in Microsoft. There's a reason why she ended up with it. It wasn't exactly a pleasant story, but she ended up with it. And that made her super rich. Coca-Cola did that for people in Atlanta. But just because my friend got rich on Microsoft or Coca-Cola people, it doesn't mean that investing in Washington Mutual in the Pacific Northwest, which is you know, went out of business, is a way to, to, to get rich. So that looking back, we've got to be careful because you can look back in a good way and you can look back in a bad way. And the bad way is the way that, that misleads you to come to conclusions that are more myth-based than reality-based. All right. By and the way, Jack, before, because I know you're going to cut me off here in a minute, I really want to ask another question about your service. Sure. It seems to me when I looked at it, you also include a, mark some market timing systems within Correct. the software that they get. Correct. Uh, currently, I have two systems there. Um, one, I like very much the momentum anomaly which is a kind of a trend following. Mm -hmm. But here, uh, one of the system is based on ETFs. So basically, you can switch between stock or bonds as a, uh, you know, uh, when the when the uh, markets are going down. And this system is based on one of the guests I had on my show, Gary Antonassi, who's a, um, a great um, Mm, researcher in on momentum uh, anomaly and another one it's uh, it's i would say more aggressive where you are basically rather than for example buy momentum etf there is a system which is just um making a, a ranking of stocks with the highest momentum and then you rotate it like quarterly or monthly it's, it's very flexible so it depends how you want to do it and there is also risk parity so it's pretty advanced um, system um, but the whole thing is that it's all algorithmic it's you know it's just you, you, you don't put any discretion in it and you just follow it you, you can backtest it and then you have to stick to it but I fully agree that we should avoid torturing the data as well. So I'm a big uh, fan of uh, mechanical uh, approach, but also 
simple approach because uh, people, I think they have the feeling that if there is more moving parts, the strategy is probably better, which there is, there is a higher risk of, you know, um, I, I agree. I, curve I agree. fitting, for example. Yeah. But uh, yes, you're right. It's not only the software. It's not only about the passive approach. There are also um, active strategies and um, the more are on the way. So I'm still developing that. So there will be more on it. And to be honest, I personally, I mean, as I said, I do appreciate the, the buy and hold, although I'm maybe maybe it will change over time uh, when I will be older and older. But now I still have majority of my personal uh, capital under the active strategies, but they are 100 percent systematic. So I'm I'm not a good uh, discretionary investor if you would ask me i i'm a terrible advisor <laughs> <laughs> so i get a lot of questions out of uh, folks in europe i mean it's not huge but enough that i feel like i should be figuring out some way to respond uh they are people who want to take for example our four fund our four etf strategy and they want to be able to somehow do it in europe D does is there anything about what you have in your program that would help people do that in Europe. Yes, it can actually help everyone wherever they are located because uh, you can use, um, so first of all, you can use the historical data before the era of ETFs. So then you can uh, cover that period in the data which is built in into the application. And then on top of it, you can fetch the data for specific ETFs. And as I said uh, earlier, I have access and it's part of the subscription access to over 70 exchanges over uh, around the world where you get access to the daily data uh, for these stocks uh, or ETFs or mutual funds or whatever. So basically you can build it and you can even convert it into your local currency so that you can see if you are living let's say in turkey and you know there is uh, the Tur the turkish lira is really now having a very very volatile time then you can see how just investing globally can save you from being uh, uh, so uh, in such a volatile um, market as Turkey currently. So I, I think that uh, even if you are in Europe or if you are in the United States, obviously in the United States, um, the problem, for example, in Europe is that most of the European investors, they don't have access to American ETFs by I, law, right. by regulations. Yeah. So they are forced to basically use the ETFs which are listed on the stock exchanges in Europe, like in London, Amsterdam, and so on. But uh, this is just a specific for European uh, investors. But if someone is, on the other hand, living in the United States, then there is also no problem with that software. You can just use the ETFs you have in the United States. But the data before the era of uh, ETFs is, it's I would say, uh, universal. So no matter... Great. Yeah, so I think it's pretty you know, powerful. Sounds like you're building a really neat business. I ha I'm going to ask you a really personal question, and and I know you can, you you can cut it out if you want. Uh, I started my company with a fifteen thousand dollars and a whole bunch of sweat equity, uh, and I have to ask, what did you start your company with? Actually, the major investment was my time. Yeah. Th that was my major investment. Okay, I, I'm i still working as a software engineer in some uh, commercial project. So I just had to reduce the number of hours working there because I wouldn't have enough time on my project. Yeah. But I can tell you that this project was mainly done by my personal effort. Now I have someone extra working with me, helping me with that. Great. But um, it's really... I would say low cost, uh, low cost uh, project, yeah, but I I see it like a way to, uh, I mean to go. I mean rather than investing a big bunch of money, uh, I'm starting just putting just mainly my effort into it. And once I will see it, it it's it's you know taking traction, then then I can invest more into it. I'm I'm quite div uh, also um, I would say defensive here. Uh, maybe I should be more aggressive uh, f in terms of running a business, but that's how I see it. So yes, I didn't put a lot of investment into that in terms of Good. money, mostly my work. 
Um, and now, are you a married man or a single man? I'm a married man, so with the two kids are already. So, oh my gosh, uh, yeah. Um, well, but be careful, because I just tell you now, you've asked me a lot of questions about my past, and I can I can tell you there's some risk in being so passionate about your work that uh, <laughs> other people uh, have some of want some of that passion for them. I, I, I hope you're better about that than I am because uh, it, 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 it really is a trap for people who are so involved in their work. I wish, but I'm, well. I'm happy to have a very uh, wise and smart wife because ah, uh, she understands me. And uh, I think that it's really, uh, we are just a great couple. So I think that it works perfectly, but I think that she understands that I'm very passionate also. So she understands that I work maybe more than an average person, but I love what I'm doing. So great. Uh, it works uh, fine for us. That's great. Um, well, I yeah. do wish you well. Do you have any more questions for me before I go down and see my wife? Yes. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I know I was keeping you. I, I'm not going to keep you here for ages. Yeah, we are talking like almost two hours. So sorry oh. for that. <laughs> uh, so let me just ask you the last question or maybe just two questions. Last question today when I was running in the park, I was listening to your podcast uh, about cryptocurrencies. Mm. And quite often I get and just a disclaimer, I'm not uh, I'm not investing my personal money into cryptocurrencies, although I'm pretty still pretty young. I Maybe I just overlooked that that opportunity. I don't know, but I'm still very old-fashioned in terms of investing. That's my personal view. Although I'm not discouraging at all fully that you cannot put any money into it, but I wanted to know your uh, approach into that. For example, quite often I get a question from other people. What if I would put 5% or 3% into a cryptocurrency? So I'm not going to put everything into it. Although, as I heard today in your, on your podcast, there was a person saying that she doesn't want to invest on the stock market because it's too risky. And she put everything into the Bitcoin. Um, yeah. Well, she what, put she, the only money she ever put at risk was in the bit. She didn't put everything. If I yes. said everything, I overstated. But on the, at, the, at the same time saying that stock market is risky. So how do yeah, you see that yeah. personally? Three, five percent in the portfolio. Do you see it as a reasonable or not? Well, it, 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 that's just whether it's Bitcoin or individual stocks. The question is, people say, well, can't I have some play money? And my answer has always been because I don't have any money invested that is play money, not not a penny. It's it's just there to do the best it can for our family and and our and the and the charitable causes that we that we care about. So it, I don't look to investing uh, as a way to prove anything uh, or to buy more to live a higher lifestyle because I hit a home run. Um, I say that if you know. You're not going to need that money later in life if you know that. And the problem is we don't often know that, uh, that we, people who have lots of money. In fact, I think about people uh, who are buying art and paying millions of dollars for, uh, in, in essence, w w what is digital art and and. And so what am I to do with that? You know something? I don't care. I mean, they can have all the games they want. They can have the biggest uh, yachts. They can, they, they can fly to the moon if they want. It had nothing to do with my life. But I have to ask the question. For people who are going into cryptocurrencies, is there, in fact, a likely value there? Uh, I had a great interview yesterday with Chris Pedersen, who retired from uh, NVIDIA. I think I'm saying that right. Uh, and 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 he was fortunate to have worked at NVIDIA because that obviously has a, uh, been a really good investment, et cetera, and, and is involved in the black blockchain part of this whole story. Uh, but he agrees uh, that you can't say there's a value. Uh, you, you can say that there's a price people will pay 
and that in fact the academics will say about the price of a stock that the value of the stock takes into consideration all of the known information and i guess at some level you could say the same thing about cryptocurrency but just because a stock sells for a thousand times earnings you're not likely to get warren buffett to put any of his money into that company because he would not likely see the value that he's looking for so uh, can can you can you go to las vegas and gamble can you go online and gamble on football games? I've talked to a lot of young people who have put money into cryptocurrency. And I, I ask them enough questions to know they don't have any idea what they're invested in. And yet, what do I hear? I hear from the experts, don't invest in things you don't understand. All right, let's say that that's a good piece of advice. What do I do then? When somebody asks me to explain cryptocurrency, now, as you know, Jack, I punted on that and I read from articles that I that I found that I felt represented something that gave some some meaning to the whole cryptocurrency. But I walked away not believing that I, that there's any value there. Having said that, coins uh, used to be of a shells used to be money they were money they were just as good as a dollar a shell off the beach what's that about well it's about a different time evidently and 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 i know for example that if you own some confederate bonds it's hard to to, to cash them in and get the money back for those confederate bonds because they're gone and what are there? A hundred plus cryptocurrencies now, right? I, I, I've seen some number. It's a lot. And will all of them survive? I doubt it. But not all the people that started companies to make cars survived. So it, it it's hard. And so my belief is that I'm going to continue to give advice where I can somehow identify a value. And to encourage people who have invested in those, those mutual funds or ETFs to continue to hold them during the ups and downs, even though there will be points that it will be e easy to say, hmm, seems overvalued to me. And there'll be points where it'll feel like, oh, my God, I know it's going to go lower that those responses, emotional responses, even though intellectually they make sense, I am hoping that people will be able to override them because the history is they don't do well trying to market time their emotions. But I am, I worry for the young people who are going to likely uh, blow a lot of money by with the cryptocurrencies at some point um they're just i'll just share one other thing people you, you, we know what bernie madoff did yep. was he created a ponzi scheme lots of people know they're in a ponzi scheme this is the a fascinating part of this they know they're in a Ponzi scheme, but it is their intent to get out of the Ponzi scheme while the getting is good. And I suspect that many of the people who are in what may end up to look like a Ponzi scheme in the end, I don't know. I honestly don't know um, th that they will just be late to get out uh, be because it's hard to pull the plug particularly when you become a millionaire. In fact, some guy put in $8,000. I don't know if this is real or imaginary, and now it's worth over $5 billion in one of the cryptocurrencies. I faced that very same problem personally. It wasn't with 18000 It was with 15000 It wasn't $5 billion, but it was enough to sell my company and have enough to live for the rest of our life. 
and others could go on. I could pass the baton of risk to them, and they could hopefully do well with it as we did well with it. But it's the same thing. At what point do you say enough and you pass the baton when you have been lucky? How many people who win a lottery blow it? Supposedly, most of them. I, I, I don't know how they do it or why they do it, but they do it according to the experts. And I, I think, boy, when you have that one chance in life, it'd be nice to be able to capture that value, not only for you, but but for the people who survive you and the charities and folks, the causes that you believe in. Yeah, thank you for that. All right, so really the last question, and um, I know it's like two hours now, but really the last one, and I think it should be the easiest one. As you are the author of many books and numerous articles, what do you propose to start with for a beginner investor? Because when I came to your website, there's so many you know, materials, so maybe someone can feel overwhelmed. So if you could just give a path to uh, the beginner investor from uh, what to start? Well, there are two, uh, well, three books in theory that are for the beginner investor on the site that are free. The one that I would probably recommend is we're talking millions, 12 simple ways to supercharge your retirement. Understand that each of those 12 ways is a million dollar decision. Now, does that mean that if you do those 12, you could have 12 million plus? Absolutely. Does that mean you have to put up millions of dollars to get there? No. But it will give you the basics. And in the second half of that book, I talk about two funds for life in a very simple, simple way. Now, Chris Pedersen has just published a book. All the profits go to our foundation. Uh, it is entitled Two Funds for Life. And it's and and it's a 280-page book that goes into oh so much detail. I just think it is an absolutely wonderful book, but it's for people who want to take the time to dig and understand because it's a lifetime discipline and worth understanding. We also have a book that's free entitled 101 Investment Decisions Guaranteed to Change Your Financial Future, as well as another book for first-time investors. Those last two books are going to be updated in the coming four or five months. They were written when we started the foundation. And we have not updated them, but they are about to get an overhaul. But those three books ought to give you a lot of what you need. But the 12, the book of 12, boy, when you think that there are 12 things that could lead each to a million dollars, you know, that's worth reading and hopefully <laughs> taking it seriously. And of course, as you know, Jack, we have, I think, 700 articles and podcasts, lots of videos. And for the people who are old timers, and trying to figure out how to make the last part of their life work financially, I made a video for 10 people. In the old days, I would have walked in. This is pre-COVID. I would have walked into the Bainbridge Island Senior Center, and I would have made my presentation to 10 people about my favorite 12 Vanguard funds for retirees. But instead, because I couldn't do that, we did it as a Zoom presentation. And then just for the fun of it, we put it on the internet. And we have had over 100,000 views uh, of, that, uh, of that Zoom presentation. So we're doing work for old people as well as young people. I've, I've got to be there to help my friends that are the same age I am. And boy, I'm, I'm rooting for them. So uh, I hope that I'm being of some help to your young followers, Jack, and I suspect you got some middle-aged followers as well. Uh, I am excited about sharing this interview uh, with our podcast listeners. We may have to break it up into two parts, uh, <laughs> but but it, only because, I mean, also because I want them 
for, to, to know about what you're doing. We have a lot of people who write to me wanting to know more about market timing. And I gently put them off. But uh, uh, you've done just a ton of stuff that I think uh, will be of value. And I also think you're going to hear from some of our folks who are serious buy and holders who want to dig into more of the history, not just of <coughs> the areas that we cover, but care you're doing some other stuff that we don't touch on that I think they'll find of interest. So I wish you well with your program. We'll have a link uh, when we when we write up the podcast uh, to your site. And uh, I wish you all the best with what, what you're doing. And again, thank you for having me on as a guest. I do appreciate it. Thank you, Paul, very much for for your time and for being so patient with me for over two hours. And big apologize to your wife. <laughs> and by the way, I will send her the the, the the part of the video before we were recording it so that she can uh, oh. hear about <laughs> your English Thank as you. well. <laughs> uh, you're a man of your um, word. <laughs> and by the way, uh, I encourage everyone who's listening to us to visit my website. So I, in the show notes, I will put all the links to Paul's uh, materials, uh, to his books, to his website, uh, paulmerriman.com. That's uh, your website. Um, so I will put all the information there and all the materials you mentioned. So I think it's a great reference and it's a great uh, source of um, valuable. And um, I think also the problem in the investment uh, area is that there are people who are also, you know, some charlatans and stuff like that. Yeah. And here you are really... The, the, the best quality um, um, knowledge. And I think it's a great, great value. So thank you so much, Paul, thank for, you. Paul, thank for your you time. For your it's really work. highly appreciated. And have good a good luck. day. Thank okay, you. Okay, bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.